right, so let's get started. Um, today we have with us um, Boris uh, Babenko. Babenko, <laughs> sorry. Um, he's a graduate student at UCSD, and this summer he's interning at Honda's research lab in here in Mountain View. So, um, he's going to give us a preview of uh, some work that's going to be presented at ICCB in October. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, should I just use the laptop sure. yeah. to flip? So this uh, talk is called Task-Specific Local Region Matching. And this is work I did at UCSD. My advisor is Serge Blanji, and Peter Dollar is the other co-author. He's, uh, he's finishing his, his PhD uh, at UCSD, and he's going to be at Caltech next year. Uh, and please feel free to interrupt me at any time to ask questions if anything's unclear. So the general problem that I'm going to be talking about is the, it's what's known as the correspondence problem in computer vision. Uh, most people are probably familiar, but just in case, it's when you have two or more images of the same object or the same scene, and you want to find uh, pairs of corresponding points or points that correspond to the same physical uh, point. And there's many, many applications for this. Uh, this is kind of like a low-level vision task, and we're staying agnostic to, to any possible application. But there's many applications like 3D uh, reconstruction and recognition and so on. <clears throat> The challenge is that in the two images, uh, corresponding local image regions might look substantially different because there might be various uh, geometric and photometric transformations that take place. So this is kind of a thought experiment uh, that I like to go through. What's the brute force approach to solving this problem? So this is uh, not at all practical in any way, but uh, what's, you know, what's the first thing that comes to mind? How would you solve this problem? So what you could do is go through every possible patch, image patch in the first image and crop it out and then generate a set of uh, different versions of that same image patch by applying a bunch of different transformations. So this row is a bunch of scale changes, a bunch of rotations, uh, contrast changes, and so on. So obviously this list would be infinitely long because of possible transformations, there's, there are infinitely many. And once you have this list, for every, for every version of the patch in the list, you go through the second image and you, you know, again, slide a window around until you find something that looks exactly like uh, what you're searching for. So in this case, the image is rotated, so one of the rotated image patches uh, gets matched. So there's, there's two problems with this, right, that make this uh, impo impossible practically. The first problem is you don't want to search through every single patch in the image, in both actually images. And the second problem, like I mentioned, is you don't want to generate this list of all possible transformations because there's infinitely many. So how do people solve this now? So just as a show of hands, how many people know the SIFT algorithm? OK. And how many people actually use it in an application? OK, cool. Um, so I'll, I'll be kind of picking on SIFT, but uh, by no means uh, do I mean SIFT in particular. It's just a, happens to be the most uh, popular algorithm right now. So there's, there's three steps usually, like most of these algorithms that, you know, again, every year a new one comes out. So, um, But there's usually pretty much the same three steps, which are detection, description, and matching. And I'll go through what they are. First step is detection. And this basically uh, tries to get at the first issue that I mentioned, which is you don't want to slide a window over every possible patch in the image. Uh, so you basically want to want something more sparse. So what people usually do is they run some sort of uh, saliency detector that it finds the interesting patches in the image or the patches in the image that contain a lot of information. And there's a lot of different examples of, of algorithms. Probably the best known one is uh, Harris and Firstner, uh, which are slightly different but, but very similar. And the easiest thing you can do for this is just do random sampling, right, to pick random uh, random patches in the image. And people have actually done this and gotten things to work. So. And the detection step, uh, this, this work in particular is not going to try to do anything interesting with detection. We're just going to take some off-the-shelf detection algorithm. Uh, the second step is description, which is where you go through every image patch that's centered on all the, the points that you found in the first step. And you compute some set of statistics. Right, and you get this uh, high dimensional feature vector that gets assigned to every point. And the goal is 
that the, this uh, feature vector is invariant to all kinds of different transformations. Meaning, if you take this image patch and you compute the, the feature vector, and then you transform this patch, maybe you rotate it by 90 degrees, and you compute the feature vector again, ideally you'd get the same exact thing. So again, many, many different examples, SIFT, shape, context. So the easiest thing to do here is just to take the raw pixel values. But obviously the problem with that is, you know, if you rotate the patch by 90 degrees, the descriptor is completely different. And the last step is matching, which is basically taking advantage of the fact that, you know, we, we assume that these descriptors are going to be similar for uh, similar image patches. So people do either nearest neighbor search or they threshold the distance in feature space. So you go for every image patch in the first image, you look at all the descriptors in the second image, and you find the, the closest one in feature space, or you threshold the distance. And there's a bunch of different heuristics that people use on top of that. So what are the challenges in designing these descriptor algorithms? There's basically two goals. The first goal is that similar patches are going to get descriptors that are close to each other in feature space. And image patches that are, that are not similar are going to get uh, descriptors that are far away from each other. So that when you do nearest neighbor search, these two are going to be uh, a match, which is correct. And there's, there's two things going on here. Uh, there's two, two properties of the descriptors. There's invariance and there's descriptiveness. So invariance is, what I mean by invariance is when you have a patch that gets transformed somehow, you still get a pretty close descriptor. And descriptiveness is when you have two different patches, you get different descriptors. So the way I think of this is there's some sort of there's some sort of spectrum between descriptive and invariant. So for example, if you wanted the descriptor that's completely invariant to all kinds of transformations, you could just output zero always. Right? And then no matter what you do to your, to your image patch, no matter how you transform it, rotate it, scale, uh, illumination, so on, you'll always get the same descriptor, so it's completely invariant. But it's obviously completely useless because then you'll get a bunch of uh, false positives. And on the other side, you could just take, like I said, the raw pixel values, which would be very descriptive, but it would be not robust whatsoever because do you, sure. Well, you can take histograms of raw pixel values, and then it would be just as robust to rotation. Right, exactly. So that's a, another version of a descriptor, right? So it falls somewhere in between, right, on this line. It's, so, it's uh, not completely descriptive, but it's not completely invariant. All right. So maybe that's not invariant to illumination changes or color changes or things like that. Uh, and in, in some cases, maybe you don't want that because maybe you don't want rotational invariance. So, and that's the question I'm really getting at is, you want something that's kind of in between on this line. And the question is, where exactly uh, do you want to be here? The other issue is, when I say invariant, well, invariant to what kinds of transformations? Rotation, illumination change, uh, scale, shear, all, all this kind of stuff. So where exactly do you want to be on that line? The answer is it depends on the task, right? Um, so here's just a little example. Let me explain what these, these images are. These are the same person's face, right? And it's the same, same patch, except there's a uh, lighting change. And this is the same exact patch, but one is rotated. And if you were working on some application that, that dealt with faces and you wanted to find correspondences for faces, then you'd probably want these to, to have similar descriptors and not these. Because usually faces are you know, the right way up. There's no, there's no rotation. And if, you, if your descriptor actually does have complete rotational invariance, it might actually hurt you. Because the more invariance you have, you're taking away from the descriptiveness of the, of the descriptors. So here's another illustration. So like I said, I'm going to be picking on SIFT, but if you plug in any other algorithm, you basically get the same thing. So this is a little toy experiment that we did. Uh, by no means is this a practical application. But what we did was we have letter pairs where we switched black and white. right? And then we ran the SIFT algorithm to find uh, matches. So each, each letter pair is uh, separate. right? That's why you don't see any lines between, between different letters. 
But you can basically see that it, it, it totally doesn't work, right? And of course, you could argue that you could go into the SIF code and add a few lines and basically make it work on this particular example because it's a pretty, pretty simple one, right? But the point is that when SIFT was designed, when the algorithm was designed, they had a certain, certain uh, transformations in mind that they wanted to be invariant to, like scale, rotation, some illumination stuff. And this particular transformation was not in that list, right? So usually when I, when I talk about SIFT and um, all the related algorithms, I call those uh, general purpose descriptors. They're designed for, to fit most uh, applications. But when the application becomes a little bit more exotic or different, then they fail. So how do people usually deal with this? They have to either go in and you know, design a completely new descriptor from scratch, or they have to go to the algorithm and like tune the parameters and maybe add some sort of heuristics uh, to make it work. And the idea behind our solution is to pose this as a machine learning frame, uh, problem and basically to learn a matching function, right, and learn from examples. So the difference is here, so let, let's look at the difference in, in terms of what work you have to do to make, this, uh, to make this work, right? Either you have to go in and change the algorithm, or in this case you have to go in and provide some uh, training examples. And in some cases, it's actually easier to provide training examples. It's, it's more uh, intuitive. Because changing the algorithm, it's not always clear you know, how to change the algorithm to make it uh, work for your particular application. And we're, we're using uh, boosting the Viola Jones type framework. So the algorithm is called Boom for boosted region matching. OK, so this is a very simple illustration. We want to build a classifier such that when the input is two similar patches, it outputs true. And if the input is two different looking patches, it outputs false. So it's a binary, binary classifier. So this is that same example again. And what we did here was we trained with the first 13 letters of the alphabet and then ran the algorithm on the whole, uh, on the whole alphabet. Um, so you can see here the training data is basically free just because of the way that the data was generated. But again, this is just a toy example to illustrate the point. So let's, let's look at how, what the training data looks like. The training data is, is basically a bunch of uh, uh, patch pairs, right? And they're positive if they're similar, and they're negative if they're, if they're not, if they don't correspond to the same point. And during testing, like I said, we basically take an off-the-shelf detection algorithm. We run it on both images, so each image is now represented as just a bag of uh, patches. And then we basically run the classifier on every possible pair from, from both images. So the first thing that should go off in your mind was, like, isn't this slow, right? Because let's say both images have about n patches. This is basically n squared. The classifier gets called n squared times. And uh, at first, you know, that's, that sounds pretty bad. But this is very similar to the object detection uh, problem where people slide a window across the image, right? And if the image is roughly n by n pixels, the classifier again gets called n squared times. And one way that people have come up to, to deal with this is the, the Viola and Jones uh, framework with Cascade. So again, just as a show of hands, but I guess most people have heard of this. OK, OK, cool. Yeah, so this I literally stole this figure from their paper. And I just crossed out subwindows and I put patch pairs. So this, this kind of thing is helpful when a lot of uh, the test samples are negative. right? In our case, they are. And same with the detection, detection case. right? If you're looking for faces in the image, then most of the, the subwindows that you look at are going to be negative. So this is a. And I'm just going to fly through this. Uh, each node is an uh, AdaBoost classifier. And this is a decision list where, in order to get classified true, you have to pass all, all the classifiers. And if at any point you get classified as false, the, training, the, the testing example gets thrown out, rejected. So the basic idea is that most of the times that you call the classifier, it's only going to execute you know, the first couple of stages. And you save a lot of computation that way. 
So now the question is, uh, what are the features that we use uh, to, to feed into this boosting framework? Right? So I'll go over like, the, what the Viola and Jones features are. Again, probably people are familiar. And we just had to make a minor modification because in the object detection uh, problem, you want to compute features for a single subwindow. And in this case, you want to compute features for a pair of image patches. So basically, this is some slight notation. Uh, we basically want some sort of scalar feature given two image patches. So what we do is we compute two uh, patch features for each patch. We get these v1 and v2 values. And then the pair uh, feature is just some function g that combines the, the two outputs. So I'll go through a visual of that. So this is for a standard uh, object detection, like standard uh, Viola Jones thing. They use hard type features. So let's say you wanted to detect eyes, let's say. And the features look like uh, a bunch of boxes. And the, the value of the feature is you sum up all the pixels in the green boxes, and you subtract all the pixels in the red boxes. right? And you get some scalar value. And then on top of this, they use a threshold, uh, really simple stump classifier. And that gets fed into AdaBoost. So in our case, we actually have two patches. So we have two hard type features, one for, one for each patch. And we apply them, and we get two values, v1 and v2. And that gets, into, that gets fed into some other function. So I'll say a little bit more about these features. Um, that, like all, all this kind of stuff like we didn't invent, obviously, gets used quite a bit. But it's hard to say uh, where it came from. <laughs> There's a bunch of papers on uh, all these boosting frameworks. But one, one cool idea is, instead of just using the grayscale version of the image patch, we compute a bunch of different image channels, like the gradient and the gradient orientation and so on, and uh, hue and so on. The other cool thing is, instead of just taking sums in inside of these rectangles, you can actually compute the histogram. And there's this trick that, that you can do. It's kind of like a dynamic programming trick called integral, uh, integral images makes computing these features really fast. And uh, it works for both histograms and if you just want to do the standard sum stuff. Uh, so in some cases, v1 and v2 are actually histograms, in which case the, this final feature is the, the L2 distance between the histograms. So the interesting thing to notice here is that this, these features kind of have uh, all the ingredients that uh, you know, all these different algorithms usually contain. Like, uh, so for example, if the image channel is the gradient orientation, and you do a histogram, and then you do L2, L2 distance, that starts to sound like SIFT. Right? Uh, the nice thing is that you can very easily add on into this framework uh, different, different kinds of features and different kinds of image channels. Sure. Well, well, one paper that comes to mind in this context is the image analysis. If you have a bunch of pairwise matches, then the first thing that you could do is infer the pixel transformations that these matches imply. And right. then you could do histogram normalization between the image pair and so forth prior to doing any feature extraction. That's true. That's true. So it's a, it's a different take. It's kind of like uh, generative models versus discriminative models. right? So you can model the actual transformation that happens. But here, we're, we're just interested in a, like a binary decision. Are these the same or not? Right, so in a, in a way, this is actually easier. You don't really need to know what the complex transformation is, because it could be very nonlinear and, and complicated. Arbitrary. So, so right. another paper that that suggests is, is generalization of one-shot learning by feature replacement. You take all the examples in the first, replace them with the, their counterparts in, in the second. Now you've got feature replacement. You search for this thing. Uh, who's that by? I'm not sure if I'm familiar with that. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, I mean, I've heard there's, there's, there's some work on uh, image analogies and like transforming one into the style of the other and that kind of thing. Yeah. So one question is, should the two uh, patch features be symmetric? So like we saw in this example, they, they happen to be symmetric. right? They're exactly the same. But it turns out that if you lift that constraint, 
and you just let them be whatever, then it actually, you get these kind of intuitive structures. So we did a little experiment where we trained it on 90 degree rotations. And what you get is features that look like this. And I'm not showing the, like all the information that's, that's inside the features. But if you just look at, the, at the, the rectangles of the HAR features, they really make sense because, uh, right, because the right halves are always the 90 degree rotate, rotated versions of the left halves. So what's happening is it's taking all the, the sum in this rectangle and the sum in this rectangle. Well, those boxes are right on top of the same exact pixels. So you'll get the same value for, the, for both of them. And when you, do, uh, when you subtract them or you do the L2 distance, you'll get 0. And that's uh, for a positive, for a true match. And then if there's two different patches here, you'll get some non-zero value. So it's easy to, to train or to learn. So here's another philosophical question. We've done all this work to design these features. So doesn't this kind of go against what I said before, how we don't want to spend all the time you know, designing the algorithm and so on? Well, the difference is these features get designed once. And then for each new application, you, you basically just provide the training examples. And it learns whatever it needs to learn. It learns the types of invariances that it, that it needs. The parameters are, are learned from the data. I'm actually going to skip this stuff. OK, so I just wanted to get to the results first. Um, <clears throat> so we wanted to do a bunch of experiments that kind of uh, were all over the place, basically. right? Because one of the points is I mean, this isn't for a specific application. This is kind of a general method. So we did uh, fingerprints, faces, and uh, the graffiti image. That, if you've ever seen any of these papers, that they use. They always use the same image. <clears throat> and we're comparing to SIFT. Like I said, uh, there's papers since SIFT that claim to outperform SIFT. But uh, it's usually pretty marginal improvement. And uh, it seems like people can never agree on what the best algorithm is. So I'm just taking it because it is probably the most widely used. And for the detector, we're just using the difference of Gaussian's detector that SIFT uses just to be completely consistent, right? And isolate the, the, descriptor, the descriptor and the matching part. And for all the experiments, we're using pretty much the same parameters. Maybe like a few parameters were, were changed. But all the features and stuff and all the image channels are all the same. This is the first thing. Uh, these are fingerprints. So these are, there's a cool little tool called, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Sphing or Sphinge which synthesizes fingerprints. And these look pretty real. It's a, it's a pretty neat application. Um, you can get a demo version for free, but I think if you want the, the actual thing, it, you have to pay for it. And what they use this tool for is to actually test fingerprint matching uh, algorithms. So this tool has tons of different parameters that, that lets you control uh, you know, the rotation and all this kind of stuff. And one of the parameters is uh, how hard the person is pressing on the sensor, right? So we generated a set of fingerprints where we took each fingerprint and we generated two versions, one where it's light pressing and one where it's hard, hard pressing. So I kind of zoomed in here on two local patches, and you could see they look pretty different, right? Uh, and this is kind of an interesting, uh, interesting application. And this is an application that you know, has been in the industry, and people have developed very, very specific algorithms for, for solving this problem. So we tried running SIFT. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. Uh, the other algorithm we're comparing to that I call pixel is just taking the raw pixel values. Right? It's just a baseline. So we see that SIFT doesn't do well at all, again, because this isn't really, it, SIFT wasn't really designed for this. right? But with some, with some training examples with train boom and we get pretty reasonable performance. And this, is, this, isn't, uh, this isn't an ROC curve for fingerprints. It's an ROC curve for the point matches. So some people get confused with that. Um, so yeah, so when I say we tested on three, three image pairs, people say, like, oh, that's not enough. Well, there's actually like thousands of points in each image. So you get a pretty good idea. So this ROC curve was for parameter recharge. What's the threshold? It's the classifier threshold. So the classifier returns a probability. 
right? Says so probability 80%, these are a match. So we basically threshold that probability, sweep through that. The second experiment was with the Yale phase database. So there's a data set where they have this uh, rig where people sit, and within two seconds, it takes like hundreds of, of pictures of the same person from different angles and different uh, illuminations. So um, the nice thing is that the, the photographs are registered, right? Pixel registered. There's no, uh, there's no shift or anything like that. So we took uh, pairs of images with different illumination, uh, and we, we did some, we split the data in half, right? We, we used some people for training and some people for testing. Um, And this was the result. The interesting thing is that just taking the raw pixel values actually does better than using SIFT. Um, again, because you know faces are pretty pretty specific; they don't have the usual uh, kinds of transformations. And SIFT is probably better designed for for geometric transformations mm -hmm. like rotation and stuff like that. <clears throat> and this is a, another cool example. This is uh, SIFT, and then SIFT with some post-processing, just, just showing the matches. Uh, you can see there's a lot of incorrect matches, right? So, so if, the, if the line is uh, vertical, it's basically a correct, most likely a correct match, just to visualize. Uh, so we get a lot more vertical lines. And this is the picture I was talking about that you see in, in a lot of these papers. Basically, this is the, the reference picture, and then uh, each one of these, these are, these are real. These are actually not uh, synthesized in any way. And somebody actually went through and clicked on, clicked on points, and they, they computed the true homographies between these. Uh, and that's available on the web. So, ah, OK. So that, that previous, uh, the previous images, those were actual real images, and somebody clicked on the points to get the homographies. And we use that for testing. So we use the real data for testing. And for training, we took another graffiti image. And this time, we synthesized a bunch of different, uh, different out-of-plane rotations and so on. And we use this for training. So we're training on synthetic data and testing on real data. And we get pretty good results. The blue curve is, yeah, I guess you can't see it all. <laughs> but the blue curve, I should have said this before. The blue curve is, is our algorithm. The red uh, dashed line is SIFT. And the black uh, dotted line is just the pixel values. So obviously, the pixel values don't work very well because right, if you rotate the, the image patch, you get a totally different value. And this is, a, this is an interesting figure, too. So this is, these are all the different image channels that we used. Like I mentioned, we use uh, just the grayscale pixels hue histograms, saturation, gradient magnitude, histograms of gradient orientations, and then cosine and sine of the gradient angle. And this just shows which uh, features it's picking for, for the different data sets. And some interesting things to note here. So the fingerprints and faces, that, that data is black and white. So it's not picking hue or saturation, which makes sense because those channels don't really make sense for that data. And what else is interesting? So for fingerprints, you see that it's picking mainly the channels that have to do with the gradient orientation. And, and for the graffiti experiment, the out-of-plane rotations, it's not picking uh, the image channels that have to do with uh, gradient orientation because as you, as you rotate it, the gradient orientation is sort of going to change. So, some open problems in future work. So the biggest, uh, the biggest problem with this is providing the training data, right? So you might have noticed all the experiments that we did, we got around that by using either synthetic data or right, data that was uh, collected in a very controlled manner. And in a lot of applications, you can get away with that. You can, you can train with synthetic data and then actually test on, uh, on real data. But if there was some, some easier way to train, to maybe, uh, so people call this weekly supervised, if people do uh, training for object recognition and detection in like a weekly supervised manner where they 
they give a picture and they say, okay, somewhere in this car or somewhere in this uh, picture there's a car, right? And the algorithm automatically learns. So something like that would be interesting. Um, uh, right, so let's see what I see here. Um, yeah, and I think that's about it. Do people have questions? Sure. If given you have the same data, you mean you imply that this algorithm would work always better than SIFT if you have the same data? Or can you make some, some kind of generalization on that, or is it just? Uh, I wouldn't go that far. So he, here's an interesting thing. We haven't actually tried this, but we're hoping to try this. Um, so all, all the experiments that I've shown are kind of specific tasks, right? And that was kind of the theme of the papers. What if you have some very specific task and you want to learn a matching function that works really well on this, on this example? And that seems to work. But what if you had a huge training set for all kinds of things, right? Just like uh, arbitrary 3D matching. Right? Could it actually work in that case? And that's a hard problem, right? Because you know it has to learn. Uh, it has to really find like the sweet spot on that on that spectrum. And uh, I'm not sure. I can't confidently say that it would work better than SIFT. It's quite possible that in a completely general setting, something that's uh, hand designed like SIFT might actually work better. Yeah. Was that slide show your complete complement of transformations? Hmm? Was that your complete complement of transformations? Pretty much, yeah. What else well, do you have in mind? In, in which case, were there any provisions within the algorithm for learning these in a transformation independent way? I mean, for example, binning the pixel values in a histogram instead of counting the pixels in a box. So we did do that. We did histograms uh, in those boxes. So right. for all those things, like the gradient magnitude and for the. Yeah. These were all histogram features. They were both. So we, we throw in, so that's the nice thing about the, this boosting framework is you can throw in millions of features. We randomly generate these features, right? And then the boosting uh, algorithm picks the best ones according to the training data. Well, right, but you did say that you spent some time at the outset deliberately designing a feature set. True, true. With, the, you know, with certain things in mind. But tuning the actual parameters happens automatically, right, given the training data. What do you think is the biggest difference between uh, tuning the parameters for something like SIFT and selecting the features to learn on for your approach? I was wondering if you would compare the pros and cons of each. Sure. So, I mean, I really think that once you, and I mean, I, I saw this when I was doing all these experiments, as you start adding more and more features, it actually starts helping less and less. So I really think like once you have these, this kind of uh, set, right, there's not going to be much that you can add that's going to really make a huge difference. So I really think this is, is, is more of a one-time designing thing, right? You, you design this, this pool of features and let the algorithm pick the parameters and stuff. That seems counterintuitive, right? Because if you're saying that uh, as you add more features, you get, uh, your performance doesn't improve all that much. That suggests one can get away with the smallest set of features, which it may not be that challenging to tune the parameters for it. Well, no, no, no. So, OK, I see what you're saying. I'm saying that like past a certain point, it's not going to make. Obviously, you have to have some, some reasonable uh, features to work with, right? Otherwise, nothing is going to work. But if you take the, the set that I showed and you try adding stuff, like unless you have some very, very specific application that has some sort of strange transformations, maybe, maybe it'll help. But otherwise, uh, well, you did frame this as so right. There are a lot of different tasks in the world. There's a fairly famous paper that people call Camels and Bottles. I don't know the actual title, but um, they found that the standard complement sort of texture features weren't very helpful with the bottles, and they had to go to contour features not included in your set to, to do Gradients. Yeah. Great. Okay, so, so sure. That, uh, I guess that's a reasonable question. So the, the nice thing is that you can add, uh, add things. Like, let's say you wanted to do contours or like edge type features, right? All you have to do, all you have to do in this uh, in this framework is add an extra image channel that contains like the canny edge detection. We actually, I think we actually tried that at one point, but it was, it was too slow and it wasn't making a huge uh, improvement. But and I think that's a lot easier than going into SIFT and SIFT had again not just SIFT like this family of of descriptors that are similar to SIFT. 
going in and trying to tune some of the parameters, and some of the parameters are very non-intuitive. Like uh, for SIFT, for example, SIFT is a histogram, right? So you have to pick the number of bins that you're going to have. How do you pick that number? It's just... Well, why should a learning machine have any more trouble with that? And hmm? selecting among these features and coefficients where you... So, I, think, I think that's a really interesting direction. So did you try your algorithm to learn optimal SIFT parameters for any of these tasks? There's another paper, it's VPR 07. That we, did, we didn't know about this paper while we were doing this, obviously. Uh, it's by uh, Brown and what's the other guy's name? Um, Brown and Winter? Yeah, that paper. Yeah, CVPR07. If you look that paper up, uh, so they did a similar thing so where they take um, kind of like a generalized SIF descriptor and they, they learn all the parameters. But, but in that case, you're still kind of, I guess, yeah, I guess it's, a, it's analogous, but you're constrained to the to the SIFT uh, structure, right? And I think this framework is a little bit easier to extend. Like, let's say you wanted to do something with the edges, right? You could just throw in that image channel and not change much else. But so one thing that you mentioned is that um, the biggest bottleneck is the training data. Where do you get the training data from? Right. And if you go to something like SIFT, it doesn't need any training data. So is there any thought in sort of combining these different approaches where something which doesn't actually need training data provides you the training data? Right. So kind of go back and forth? that's definitely a provocative idea. Uh, actually, one of the reviewers at ICCV mentioned, like, you know, why don't you use SIFT to get you some training data? Uh, it, it, that does sound re like a reasonable idea. The only thing is, in some cases, like, like in the fingerprints, if I go back to that slide. SIF does so bad that probably no, no learning algorithm would be able to learn from this. Well, but here's the thing, right? There, there are fantastic fingerprint matches out there which would do much better than the 80 or 90 percent. Right, right, so, that's true. So, so and, and then the really interesting thing would be like if, if we do something like Boom and we can improve that, that performance even better. Yeah, so using something like Boom and doing some, some hand designing on top of that, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting. Uh, line of work. Yes, yeah, so I guess there's two, two directions. You could try learning something that's completely general using a huge, huge data set, or go in the opposite direction and look at a very specific problem and try to actually improve the state of the art for that specific task using some learning on top. Yeah, But in, in, this, uh, in this work, we tried to keep all the features the same for all the experiments. And, try to change as little as possible, basically, other than the training data. How many patch pairs did you end up using for training? For training, it depended on the experiments, but I think it was on the order of uh, a few thousand, I think. And again, in most cases, you know, we pick the data such that the training data is free, basically. So, so in that case, like the only bottleneck is the memory and how much how much you want to wait for it to train. Jim? So for your experiments with, this, with the scene, uh, if, you, if you removed, let's say, the hue channel, mm -hmm. what do you think will happen? Uh, would it learn some other features which it will make the performance comparable to what it is now? Um, it'll be worse. So. The reason I say that confidently is because you can see here, hue is the one that it picks the most. So if you take that out and you don't add any sort of like color information, it'll definitely do a little bit worse. I, I'm not sure how much worse, but there's a lot of information in the color, right? And color, like again, hue histogram, that's uh, invariant rotation, more or less. So that's why it works well. Right, it just wouldn't pick yeah. it. So if it wasn't relevant, it would uh, Yeah, yeah. But he's saying like what if you take out something that it actually does pick? Yeah. Right. So obviously the the performance would go down a little bit. Yeah, so like I said, you have to have some reasonable set of features to start with. So something something that has to do with color, maybe if it's not hue, maybe it's like an RGB histogram or something. Have you tried uh, injecting some noise to your training set and see how quickly it does the performance degrade? Hmm. So you might be picking on the wrong transformation to learn. 
You know, so we actually, yeah, we actually had to introduce a little bit of noise in terms of the location because the detector doesn't always detect you know, exactly the same point in the two images. So that's, a, that's just a minor detail, but. No, but I mean, noise in the sense that they're really mislabeled there. It shouldn't be. Oh, mislabeled. totally mislabeled. Um, no, we didn't try anything like that. But yeah, I mean, that, that kind of goes along with this whole idea of like, how can you make training easier? I think this is a, it's a bigger question in machine learning in general. How do you make training easier? You know, how do you get away with noisily labeled data? Right, so if we tried something like using SIFT first to get the training data, there would be a lot of noise. So we'd have to probably change something to make it very robust to noise. So do you get a measure of how good the match is? In addition to the classifier saying that it's a match? Yeah, so you get a probability, and that's how we draw those RFC curves. So that's a pretty useful thing. So another, I, I should have mentioned this, this. Another cool thing about this is um, by changing the depth of that cascade, you can actually control how fast this thing is. Right? So it, there's, you know, there's a trade-off, obviously, between how fast it is, speed, and the accuracy. But for some applications, maybe you have some real-time application uh, where you don't really care about the accuracy as much, you can easily change like one parameter, right, the depth of the cascade and to make it run faster. Whereas with SIFT, it's not really clear how you would do that. Is there a question? That's true, that's true. Yeah, you actually get a probability. Any more questions? Let's thank the speaker. Thanks.